What's up, everybody, and welcome into another edition of the Sit Down Mafia History Podcast. I am your host, Jeff Nadu. Hope you're having a great day wherever you are. We are getting closer and closer to Christmas, about 10 days away. Actually, are 10 days away when you listen to this show. Uh, make sure you don't wait till the last minute to go out and get your gifts for your family. Uh, but we are closer and closer to Christmas, and another week, another dollar, another show, another sit down. Uh, we are back, uh, coming off a pretty eventful weekend for me, and our favorite co-host is back. It's Blackjack Fletcher. Blackjack, how you doing? Good to have you back. I'm good, brother. Good to be here. Yeah, like you said, we're getting close to Christmas. Festive time of the year. It's, uh, you know, it's a great time. Uh, and yeah, you you alluded to having a busy weekend. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your your weekend in West Virginia? Yeah, it was uh, it was eventful, man. Uh, we kind of talked about it last week, just kind of knowing that that we would have the show, and 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 you know, after that, I'd head down to West Virginia, and it was uh, it was quite the experience. Um, you know, I obviously came out uh, in the fight uh, a loser. Um, I don't take a lot away from it, as far as look in those kind of fights. It, it's not we're not professionals, we're not real boxers. Um, I felt like I didn't do what I wanted to do, you know, blackjack. It's crazy because when you get in that situation, you have a game plan. And then when you get in there and you deal with all the things that are going on around the fans and and the cameras and and just everything going on, you really just try to stay upright and and not get knocked out. But I wish in looking back, I did some stuff different, but it was a great experience. And uh, one that, you know, maybe if I ever get the next chance, uh, it'll be a lot different, but um, what did you think of the fight? It was a mess. I knew that. I mean, it was definitely a mess. I thought you acquitted yourself pretty well. I mean, I think, you know, you took some shots and you stood in there and, you know, I, I think that, I think he made it hard on you because he, it looked to me watching the fight that he was doing a lot of grabbing, that he was trying to fight you in a phone booth. And it looked like you couldn't really get your offense going because he was doing a lot of leaning on you and grabbing. No, that's so right. And he also had this way of like running at me and putting his head down into my like chest. And it was, um, you know, in rewatching the fight and watching it over, like by really the 10 second mark of the first round, I felt like I did what I had to do. He just had a really great final 10 seconds and really got some big shots in and, and was able to win that round. Second round, he won. I felt like I won the third. So, you know, I thought even all was pretty, it was pretty close. Um, as I said, you know, we're both, warriors for getting in there and we both do what we had to do and uh you know i don't think anyone walked away and said wow you know that guy got tagged i think everyone got respect in it and it just was what it was but i will let everyone know look if you ever get a chance to watch rough and rowdy i would highly recommend it it is a great oh event God. um it is quite the spectacle isn't it the the guy who I, I don't remember his name but the guy who who got a knockout and was just air humping everyone in <laughs> sight yeah. was made it worth the money by himself yeah he um he had a really epic um conversation after the fact uh okay. he'll now get a huge fight coming up against uh, the undefeated champion uh it'll be uh, it'll be quite the, the spectacle but you know i thank anyone that bought it i thank anyone that that listens to the show that went and checked it out um it did really well i think they got sixty thousand pay-per-view buys so uh, it went really well. It was, I think, outside of the, the Jose Canseco Rough and Rowdy, the best Rough and Rowdy they've had. So we definitely moved the needle. We definitely did a good job with it. And we definitely uh, both helped ourselves. So um, it was an eventful weekend. And, you know, Blackjack, uh, I was attacked in the uh, hallway. I don't know if you saw that. I did. Um, there could be another fight on the horizon. Coward, a cowardly attack with your back turned. Yeah. Did you notice I just laughed and smiled and just said, yep. I'm I mean, happy. listen, that's typical for that asshole. He waits till your back is turned, pushes you, and then runs into a room with three people blocking him. So, right, you know, typical. Yeah, it really was. But uh, I want to thank everybody for checking out the show last week. Uh, already uh, doing super well, up over 10,000 listens on the Jimmy uh, Fiala episode. And, you know, it was a good episode to really kind of head into going over to the fight because it wasn't a long episode. People were able to listen to it quick. But, you know, we're going to kind of stay in the Gambino wheelhouse. And this is a show that I've really wanted to do for a while. And there's a reason we're doing it this week. Obviously, if you know anything about the mafia, most of the people that listen to the show, know all about the mob. They know what is synonymous with December 16th, 1985, which is tomorrow. 
Um, we're going to talk about the assassination and frankly, the biggest event, probably from a hit standpoint in the history of the American mob. It was an absolutely perfect hit. It went absolutely well. And we're going to talk about who were the shooters, why it all happened and what happened to those shooters after the fact. They all had pretty colorful lives. Um, and really, the federal government really didn't know much about who the shooters were really until many years later. Um, I guess I'll ask you, Blackjack, when we look at the Gambino family, it really has a history of people taking um, by force and people becoming what they are uh, by taking what they want. And that started, you know, back in the 50s when uh, Albert Anastasia decided that, you know, he wanted to kind of take control and, and he got Vincent Mangano out of the way. And then, you know, obviously Albert Anastasia was whacked by another power grab and Carla Gambino eventually took over. John Gotti realized, and John Gotti obviously is the main purveyor of this homicide. He realized that unlike his predecessor, Neil Della Croce, he was not going to stand idly by and allow Paul Castellano to bleed the family to death. Now, there are multitudes of reasons of why this happened, and we're going to get into all of them, but we would have to agree, this is probably, is this the, the biggest moment in the history of the mob? It's the single biggest moment in the history of the American mafia. It is a hit that is big enough. It, well, you, you used the term correctly earlier in your description as an assassination. I mean, this is a, a, a killing that after presidential assassinations, it's right there. I mean, it's right there. Like this was a brazen brazen hit that took place that we can't fathom something like this happening today. No, and it never would. Um, this is the perfect hit. And when we look back at kind of the creation of this idea, I think the whole thought was, and look, Sam Gravano, I will say, does provide some really colorful, interesting talk into how this hit went down. Look, obviously, there were a multitude of reasons as to why Paul Castellano was hit. One of them was the fact that Paul was obviously, you know, losing respect. I mean, he was uh, greedy. He was demanding. Um, he was bleeding the family to death. And obviously, that did a lot. You obviously look at the fact that um, Paul didn't attend the wake of Neil De La Croce. That was a major slap in the face to the Gotti contingent. And quite namely... The Gotti group realized that Paul likely was going to have them killed. If we know anything about Quack Quack Ruggiero, he was really the big issue here because, yeah, he starts selling heroin. Um, he gets jammed up. He starts getting uh, recorded. Um, they eventually, um, you know, kind of mention to Paul that there's all these recordings and that could help his case. Ruggiero doesn't want to give up the tapes because he knows he's talking about Castellano and everybody else. And, John Gotti pretty much realized, look, these are my guys. Um, he's probably likely going to kill me. Throw in the fact, remember, Paul was also on trial. He was involved with the Roy DeMeo uh, right. car theft ring, and he was involved with the commission case. A lot of people wondered, could Paul Castellano be trusted? So, you know, th this kind of continues the same thought that, you know, Paul had to go. Um, no one wanted to worry about whether he was going to talk or not. And there was other things that he was losing credibility with. And look, in typical Gambino fashion, John Gotti took what he wanted. And this was the difference between him and Della Croce. And I'm not going to say Della Croce wasn't a, a astute mafia figure because no. he was. But again, Blackjack, real quick. And I know you're a big Della Croce guy. Neil was never willing to do what had to be done that others were willing to do. They became the boss over him. No, I mean, you're, you're right. Neil was a guy who thought that, you know, we have these rules, we have this system in place, and we have to obey it at all costs. You know, if we get a bad boss, we get a bad boss and we deal with him. We don't go out and clip him because of the attention it's going to bring. Because if, and the other thing is too, if you start that cycle of, oh, one, one group is upset with the boss, so we take him out. Where does that end, right? So I get Neil's reasoning for not doing it. I don't think that there was much of a choice, though, with Paul Castellano for a variety of reasons that we'll get into. Yeah, and what we're going to do is we're really going to kind of paint the picture of that evening. 
uh, December 16th, 1985, really, um, you know, very similar to, you know, obviously we're in that time of the year right now, you know, it's a bustling time. It gets dark early. Um, you know, there's hundreds, if not thousands of people walking up and down 46, second, third avenues. Um, this is a busy time. It's rush hour. It's five, about five 30 Eastern standard time. Um, this was a plotted assassination that it wasn't like, you know, they ran up to Paul as he drove down his driveway or something. This was in the largest city in America in the busiest time of the year uh, with witnesses everywhere. And according to Gravano, this had to be a perfect hit. It was a perfect spot for mass confusion for them to really blend in and really blend into the night, frankly, uh, and get out of there quickly. And what Gravano, DeChico, and John Gotti realized is DeChico mentioned that this would be a perfect location. He had wind that he had to meet Paul and Jimmy Fiala at Sparks. It was one of the restaurants Paul enjoyed. And he mentioned that to Gravano and Gotti. And Gravano was tasked with putting the hit in motion. And at one point, Gotti began to talk and DeChico told him to basically shut the fuck up, let Gravano handle this. He's been through wars before. He's a guy that can likely get this done. So what they decide was they're going to not only have two shooters for each individual that came out of the car, because it was going to be Bellotti and obviously Castellano, but they were also going to set up backup shooters in the case something bad happened. There were multiple people to anchor and get the cars out of there and for everyone to blend into the night. So let's kind of get into it. The Paul Castellano hit, we're just going to kind of talk about the actual hit itself, what all went down, and I'm going to kind of get into some of the shooters and where they went in their lives and in their careers and really got how they shaped uh, the family for what it was. And really, we're frankly the last of the Mohicans when it came to the Gambinos. Once Gotti went away, um, you know, we had obviously the run of Junior and, and Peter Gotti. And look, obviously, as a family now, they are a fairly well, well oiled machine. But uh, let's get into it. I will obviously advise there are going to be a lot of names. I'll try to uh, present them in the easiest way for people to follow. Uh, so December 16th, 1985. What, Black Eric, I'll have to ask you, what, um, what year were you born? 84. Okay, so you were born one year before... Uh, this uh, situation. I'll ask you, before we kind of get into the crux of everything, you are from New York, the New York area. You're from Long Island. I have to ask you, um, have you ever talked to your dad about this event? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Um, My dad was born and raised in New York City. And there are two things in his life that he can tell me, even to this day, 74 years old, exactly where he was and what he was doing and that was the kennedy assassination and the hit on paul castellano and what did he say about that night i mean he just remembers seeing it on the tv that night you know on the news pretty much right after it had happened and thinking that you know new york city was headed towards you know essentially mob wars because paul castellano as you said was the a, a major boss i mean he was under indictment he was in the news there was all this federal surveillance of the mafia at the time and to go out and make this hit in the way that they did publicly in the middle of the street in rush hour during christmas season it's as big of a statement as you can possibly make right this isn't breaking into a guy's house while he's asleep and putting a bullet in his head on on his pillow. This is, you are making a statement and you are making it loud. And I think it put a chill into a lot of people because it it was really making a declaration that like, we're here and and we're not going anywhere. As uh, the Gravano character stated in the film, Gotti, shit, John, this is bigger than killing the fucking president. Uh, And it really was. you look at December 16th, 1985, it was a Monday. Uh, it was uh, really just a, a typical week right before Christmas. The president at the time was Ronald Reagan. The mayor of New York was Ed Koch. And, um, you know, it was a festive time around New York. Castellano had uh, been tasked with having to head into the city. Uh, he had to leave the, the beautiful and 
palacious White House to head in to meet Frankie DeChico and uh, James Jimmy Brown Fiala, who, as we know from last week's episode, was the garbage king uh, of New York City. Now, Spark Steakhouse was the place that Paul uh, enjoyed going. It was on East 46th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. And obviously, it doesn't get busier than that area. And that is Midtown Manhattan. Uh, it is not far from Times Square. It is in the smack dab uh, of New York City. And it occurred at 5.26 p.m. A Lincoln Continental sedan limo pulls up uh, to the street. Now, as it pulls up, they were tasked, the four backup or four main shooters were wearing trench coats and Russian style Cossack hats. And they were basically tasked with pumping bullets into the both of them. And then there were the backup shooters. I want to talk about who the shooters were. Uh, the initial two shooters to kill Castellano, they would shoot to him six different times. Six shell casings from automatic weapons are found next to the body of Castellano. The main shooter uh, was an individual, John Carneglia. Uh, Carneglia was a Gotti loyalist. He had been with John uh, Gotti for many years, and he was known to be one of the best hitmen in uh, the Gambino crime family. They called him Johnny Carnegs. Um, he was from Ozone Parks. He was a big drug dealer. Uh, and when he needed to do things, he did things. It was that simple. Um, he was also very much involved in the early 80s, not only with um, the three capos hit. If we remember that hit in the Bonanno crime family, if you remember Blackjack, the Gambinos were tasked with disposing the bodies of Philip Lucky Giancone, Dominic Trinchera, and Alphonse and Delicato. Carneglia was very uh, big in getting rid of the bodies. It was also said that he was the shooter of John Favara. If you remember, John Favara was accidentally involved with killing uh, John Gotti's 12-year-old son, Frank. Now, Favara's remains are never recovered, but it was long rumored that Blackjack Carneglia was the shooter in the Favara hit. Yeah, and that makes sense to some degree, right? Because if what you just said, uh, Carneglia was a Gotti guy. He was a guy that Gotti trusted. And everyone in organized crime has guys that they trust to take care of business. You know, Paul Castellano trusted Sammy Gravano to do that for a long, for a long time. And John Gotti trusted Carneglia. So it makes sense that the Favara hit, which was going to be so heavily scrutinized and had to be done right, because even though Gotti was on vacation in Florida with his family, everyone in the world knew that this was going to send eyeballs Gotti's way. It had to be done right. So you're going to use someone you trust. And Carneglia was a guy he trusted to do these things. Yeah, I mean, Carneglia, along with people like Joe Watts, were probably the most um, trusted uh, killers for Gotti. There were obviously others. Gravano obviously was a known killer. Um, but Carneglia was tasked with being really the main shooter in the, the twosome that killed Castellano. The other individual involved in this hit was uh, Vincent uh, Vinny Dirtbag uh, Artuso. He was the other shooter of Castellano. Now, as the hit happens, a witness would mention that he heard uh, Artuso right before the car pulled up say, where the hell are they? Quote, they were supposed to be here by now. Uh, as the car pulls up, Carneglia starts unloading and guess Castellano gets out. Artuso's gun would actually jam, interestingly enough. Now, there's been a lot of mob lore that Artuso's gun didn't jam and that uh, Artuso just got cold feet. Uh, but he was, quote, after the fact, embarrassed uh, that he wasn't able to be involved. Um, he would go on to have a pretty interesting mob career. Uh, he would be jammed up in 1995 on a parole violation. Uh, upon his release, he would head down to Florida to, uh, a lot of people believe, uh, head up with Andy Ruggiano. However, he would go on his own. It was well known uh, that Artusa was um, a bakery owner. His father uh, was a bakery owner up in the Bronx. And Artuso Pastry, I believe, is still actually in business. Um, you can uh, go up and, and get a nice cake or you know brownie or something 
uh, from Artusa's brothers who actually still own uh, the restaurant. So uh, Artusa had a pretty interesting mob life. He actually recently just died uh, in uh, August of 2021. So, Blackjack, I'll ask you, um, these people that were involved with this killing were said to be the best of the best in the Gambino crime family. You would agree that it is a real mob lore that his gun jammed. I mean, that, that's probably true. Uh, to think that he wasn't able to pull the trigger seems a little bit far fetched. I don't think you run that risk. I don't. I, I think it's at that point once you're that far in and you're on the street with these other guys, you you're pot committed. Like I, I think you run a greater personal risk <laughs> by lying about the gun and having someone grab it and say, "Oh yeah." fires just fine now and pulling it on you um so no i i don't i don't believe that he got cold feet i think the gun jammed guns jam it happens yeah and keep in mind in 2008 uh, Vinny artuso would actually go back to prison him and his son john vincent artuso would be indicted in an 11 million dollar real estate fraud scheme they would get nine years in prison and he would get out in 2016 as i said uh, Vincent Artuso died uh, just a couple of months ago uh, at the age of 76. Um, if you've ever seen Vincent Artuso, he has a very similar resemblance to uh, Pauly Walnut's Galtieri, if you've ever seen him. He actually looks uh, very similar uh, to uh, Pauly Walnut's. Now, there was another individual that needed to be killed. Obviously, that was the driver, uh, Tommy Bellotti. Now, Bellotti was a loan shark. He had a huge uh, loan book. Uh, he was from Staten Island. He was very trusted uh, by Paul Castellano and frankly was Paul's protege. Uh, he had come up under Paul. They owned a concrete company together. Uh, Bilotti was very involved with different unions, including plumber and steam fitter unions. Um, he was very big in mob unions and he was um, very trusted. He was an underboss. He was someone that uh, Paul uh, ha liked having around him. He was a friend to him. Um, he would need to be killed as well. The individuals that were tasked with killing him were Eddie Lino and Salvatore Fat Sal Scala. Now, they would both run up and pump uh, bullets into the uh, unsuspecting Bilotti. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Lino and Scala were actually brother-in-laws. Uh, Lino married into the Scala family. He married the sister of Fat Sal Scala. Now, Eddie Lino would actually move up in the road after this. There's an interesting caveat with all of the people involved with this. Many of them obviously became higher ups in the family after this. They were all kind of saying, you know what, you're going to deal with this. You're going to be involved and you're all going to be taken care of after the fact. Lino would be promoted to captain in 1986. And was actually tasked with some pretty important things after the fact. He would actually set up the killing of mob rat uh, Willie Boy Johnson. Now, Willie Boy, as we know, uh, was not an Italian. He was, though, very close with Gotti. He would eventually be found out about as a rat, and he would need to go. Uh, it was said that Bonanno hitmen Tommy Patera and Vincent uh, Giatino were tasked by Eddie Lino to kill a Willie boy, and they would take care of that. Now, Eddie Lino would actually die in 1990. If we remember, he would actually be killed on the Belt Parkway by uh, none other than the mafia cops, Louis Apolito and Stephen Caracapa on orders from Anthony Casa. Now, there is a long-standing mob myth, Blackjack, that Ed Lino, the main reason he was killed um, was also obviously the fact that uh, he was involved with uh, the Castellano hit and it was unsanctioned, but um, Stephen Caracapa took it personally. It was said that he was close growing up with Tom Bellotti and Eddie Lino was uh, whacked off because of that connection as well. Uh, we'll never truly know, um, but Lino and his family were very known in the mob. If you know anything about some of his brothers and cousins, um, uh, but yeah, we talked about him during the Mafia Cops episode, who we all know they killed many people. For sure. I mean, and, and the link between Caracapa, you know, and, and Lino, and the Lottie, rather, is definitely there. I mean, that, that link, I think, is pretty well established. So I think the fact that 
you know, Lino was involved with this and Tommy Bellotti was taken out, certainly played into Cara Kappa <laughs> taking him out, which they weren't shy about doing, as you mentioned. But I mean, there was no choice, Jeff. I mean, Tommy Bellotti had to go. As you said, he was Paul's protege and there was no chance you could trust him to be left out on the streets after this hit on Castellano. There was no way he had to go. No, and we actually saw a very similar situation happen uh, many years before when Albert Anastasia was killed. Uh, one of the individuals that remained a loyalist to Anastasia was Armand Reva. And Armand Reva would actually um, be dealt with for a little bit, but Carlo Gambino would eventually have him killed because he said, look, we can't have um, people that are loyal to the people that were here before. Um, if they're not going to get in line, they got to go. And as the old adage says, you either get down or lay down. It's pretty simple. Uh, and, you know, Tom Bellotti was an old school guy. He wasn't going to play ball with Gotti. And it was only, always going to be problematic for Gotti. And he was smart enough uh, to know that. And Bellotti had to go. Uh, and it just made sense. He was a witness anyway. Um, why not just kill them both? Um, the other individual involved with killing Lino was uh, Lino's brother-in-law, Fat Salvatore Scala. Now, Scala had a pretty interesting life, frankly, after all of this. He was actually born in New Jersey. Uh, he would eventually get connected with uh, the family and would also benefit from this going down. He would become uh, a capo as well uh, in 1999, many years after. Uh, but he was involved in a lot of high profile things. He began as a driver for Peter Gotti, uh, would attend all sorts of different events, including the wedding of John Gotti Jr. It was said that he gave uh, $2,000 to the son of Gotti Sr. And he was becoming a big timer in the family. As I said, he would eventually become captain in 1999 uh, after uh, Peter Gotti uh, would take on a new role. He would take over the Ozone Park uh, crew or the Bergen crew, frankly. Salvatore Scala would uh, get jammed up though uh, after extorting a video store in Long Island, a place called Cherry Videos. Uh, he would get six years in prison. And at the end of the day, Blackjack, it was said uh, he was jammed up for the small sum of just $50. Um, <laughs> he would eventually get out of prison and get jammed up again uh, in extortion of the VIP club, which is a strip club in Manhattan. Um, he would ask for leniency. It wouldn't matter. Uh, he would eventually die in prison from liver cancer. Um so all of these main shooters would ultimately get bigger roles. Lino and Scala would become captains. Uh, Carneglia would obviously continue to be very respected. And Vinny Artuso was given umbrage really to kind of go and do whatever he wanted. He was able to create new territory down in Florida and ended up living a pretty damn good life only to go to prison many years later for real estate scams. Um, there obviously were backup shooters. and. It's interesting that they needed six shots. That's a lot to kill somebody. Obviously, Paul was a big guy, though. Um, and, you know, sometimes you have to unload into somebody. I guess when you think about it, it's not that many, though, especially for a guy of that size. I think there's two factors. First, you got to make sure he's dead, right? There can be no surviving this. He has to die, right? There's You have to make absolutely certain of it. And the other thing is, I think that you want to make a statement here. Overkill is a thing here, right? Like I think you want to scare off anyone else who may potentially be a loyalist to Paul or who may think that, and maybe anyone in the other families who views what you're doing as, you know, stepping out of line, you want to send a message here. This isn't going to be, you know, quick and neat. This is going to be dirty. And it, you, you've got to send that message to everyone loud and clear. So I think those are the two reasons why you, you do it that way. Yeah, hundred percent. And, you know, I, I also wanted to mention with John Corneglia, who really I think was the main shooter in all of this, he had really the biggest job because he had to kill Castellano on his own. He didn't have another shooter with him because of Artuso's gun. Uh, Corneglia obviously became um, the, the main hitman for uh, the family. However, um, in 1989, he would uh, go to jail for drug trafficking involving Gene Gotti and other people in the family. Uh, it was said that he turned down a plea deal in 1983 that would have got him just seven years 
he eventually went to trial and was hit with 50 years. And he would write in 2009 to a family member that if he had taken a plea back in 83, he would have been home almost 20 years by now. Uh, Carniglia would be released in June of 2018, and he is still alive at the age of 76. According to many, including uh, an individual we interviewed, uh, Chad Marks, he has said that uh, he knew Carneglia in prison and that he was, quote, a really nice guy. So, um, you know, he was known to be an eccentric guy, as far as I know. He always had a, a big beard, and he was said to be a pretty funny guy. And as we know, uh, Carneglia is one of the only people still alive uh, from the hit. As far as the four shooters involved with Bellotti and Castellano, um, he is the only one still alive. Uh, now, what he does now, I have no idea. I would have to imagine he's just trying to live out the rest of his life in uh, regard and anonymity, I would imagine. Uh, but uh, again, Blackjack, once a shooter, always a shooter, right? Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, listen, I'm sure at this point, you know, as an old man, he's just looking to live his days out quietly. But, you know, you got that you got that thing inside you that doesn't go away. Exactly. Now, there were four people involved with the backup shooter role. And obviously they did exactly that, but they also were big in making sure the individuals got in the cars and got out of there. There were crash cars. There was everything going on. So everyone got out of there swiftly and easily. The individual directly across the street that would act almost as a fish shooter in the case something would go down uh, or they would run away or something was an individual called Anthony Tony Roach Rampino. Now, Tony Roach got his nickname from, quite frankly, looking like a cockroach, according to many. Uh, if you've ever seen Tony Roach, he was not a good-looking individual by any means. Um, he was from Ozone Park. He had grew up uh, around um, Gotti, Ruggiero, and Nicky Carrazzo. Um, he was said to be a very good thief uh, many years ago, and uh, was a great stickball player, according to many. Um, the problem that Tony Roach would have, and, and we'll get into it, uh, was heroin. He was a big-time heroin addict. It was said that he shot up close to 10 times per day. Mm. Uh, he was tasked with being across the street and that no one was to interfere. So if there was, let's say, an undercover officer or some cop that would show up, um, he was said to have been the person that would have taken them out. And Gravano would mention many years later that during his cooperation, there was an off-duty cop, an undercover cop, I guess he was off the job, that actually was in the crowd that day and that it was done so well that he decided not to intervene, uh, according to Gravano. Now, Gravano testified and basically admitted that if he did, uh, they would have killed the cop as well. Um, right after the hit, he would Rampino slide back into heroin addiction and really would be the only one that suffered a really terrible fate, quite frankly. Uh, John Gotti would eventually be caught on wiretap saying, quote, you know, soon enough, we're going to have to take care of all these problems like Roach. Uh, and Gotti knew that Tony Rampino was a liability at this point. Um, he was addicted to drugs. He was a loose cannon. And in 1987, he had a major issue. He would be arrested for selling $30,000 of pure heroin to an undercover police officer in Queens. And it was said that Rampino allegedly tried to cooperate. He, quote, told the feds that he knew uh, about the shooters and he was very close with Gotti. Um, problem was Gotti found out about it. Uh, it wouldn't matter. Uh, Rampino got 25 years to life in prison and would die uh, in uh, 2010 uh, from heart and respiratory ailments. Um, so Rampino ended up having a pretty sad end of his life. He uh, basically went to jail and died in prison, a very sick man, and probably dope sick and had to go through all that stuff. Um, Blackjack, let me ask you, do you believe the quote by Gravano that if a cop intervened, they would have murdered him? I do, yeah. I mean, I don't see how... At that, listen, it's like we talked about with the gun jamming, right? Like at that point, you are fully committed. You are all in. You can't retreat. You can't stop. This This hit was a kill or be killed kind of hit. If a cop interfered, you shoot it out with the cop. Like I don't, I don't think they had a choice, Jeff. There was no other way to go here. 
you're taking out a boss in, you know, broad daylight. I mean, like, it, it, you don't have a choice. There is no retreat. You can't go back and say, oh, well, we didn't get him this time. Now he knows. Like, now he knows what hap- what's happening. If a cop shows up, you shoot it out with cops. Yeah, and Gotti would mention that um, before. Gotti Jr. mentioned that, that his father uh, would all- always mention that you don't ever retreat. You, you let them leave you there, you leave them there pretty much. And that's how it's got to go. And that's how it's got to be. And I think you're hundred percent right. Um, you obviously do what you can do. You make sure no citizens are involved, but if someone else intervenes, um, there's going to be collateral damage, basically. It's that simple. Um, the other three people involved were actually stationed uh, on second Avenue uh, to make sure that everyone got out of there completely uh, unscathed. Um, they were, uh, Joe Watts, Dominic Skinny Don Pazonia, and Quack Quack Rogeria. Now, Joe Watts uh, ended up making out really well after the Bellotti and Castellano hit. Uh, Joe Watts was uh, given the black book for Tommy Bellotti's loan sharking business. And it was said that he was making about 40 grand a month uh, from loan shark uh, business. He was a becoming a very rich man, frankly. And he was a big time earner. He was said to be very respected. Multiple people that were high up in the family were very high on Watts and that he, quote, showed John Gotti how to dress. That's how dapper Joe Watts was. Now, Joe Watts could never be made. He was Welsh, um, but he was also acted. He also acted as a liaison to the Westies uh, and was very prominent in contract killing. He was involved with multiple different murders involving um, not only um, Fred Weiss, but William Ciccone as well, uh, and others. Uh, he would actually uh, go to prison and would get out in 2021. And as far as I know, uh, he is in a halfway house, as far as I know. He was last at FCI Cumberland down in Maryland, and is scheduled to be out completely of the halfway house by March of 2022. Now, Joe Watts Blackjack is an interesting guy because he is very respected. I would probably say outside of Meyer Lansky and Jimmy Burke, he's probably the most respected non-Italian mafia member of all time. I think it's that simple. There have been multiple rumors that Joe Watts is a confidential informant. Now, Gravano was the main purveyor of this lie. But if you read into Capisci's com, Jerry Capisci's com, he would actually mention that he thought that Watts was a cooperator as well. Now, we are not saying he is. We're just talking about what they said. Um, I think it's absolute nonsense to think he was a cooperator. Uh, Joe Watts is a very respected guy uh, and is known to be trusted by pretty much everyone in the family. Uh, Watts was a big time murder and he could have gladly taken both these guys out. Um, but he made out like a bandit after the fact. That's a big loan sharking operation. Sure is. I mean, that obviously, like we said, Tommy Bellotti was Paul Castellano's right hand. You know, he was letting Tommy take, you know, the cream of the cream there. Um, and then for Joe Watts to take it over, that's, that's, that's as after, after Gotti, I would say Watts made out the best of the bunch. Yeah, hundred percent. And interestingly enough, there's a, a interesting story that I wanted to talk about Joe Watts. Um, and this is something that you can really just kind of understand who Joe Watts is. Frank Sinatra was performing at, I believe, Carnegie Hall in New York City. He invited Gotti to the show and also invited him to go to dinner after. Now, I guess Frank Sinatra decides that, hey, um, maybe I don't want to go to dinner with Gotti. I don't know. And tells Gotti that he's sick and he can't make it. Gotti goes out to dinner in New York City. And who pops up in the dinner? Sinatra walks in. Uh, According to reports, Joe Watts walks over to Frank Sinatra and says, basically, look, the next time Gotti asks you to do something and you make some bullshit excuse up, quote, I'll be the last face you'll see on earth, end quote. And I would imagine that Frank Sinatra uh, never did that again. Uh, Joe Watts was a very respected guy and a very powerful guy and was well-respected uh, by pretty much everybody. Um, the two other individuals involved were uh, Don Pazonia, who 
I think has one of the more interesting lives of Gambino people involved in this. Uh, as far as I know, Don Pazonio is still alive. He actually had a, um, a wild career. He'd eventually become a Kappa regime in 1995 uh, and would take over the kind of the rest of the South Scala group after he went away. Um, he was tasked with some big murders as well. He would kill uh, the Rosemary and Thomas Uva group. If you remember those two black chicks, they were robbing mob social clubs. Um, and it was said that uh, Pazonia was one of the trigger men in killing them at a traffic light uh, in 1992. Uh, they made movies about those two. If you've ever uh, seen The Wannabe uh, or um, Rob the Mob, great films. Um, Pazonia was one of the shooters that killed uh, those two. It was also said that Pazonia was a very good cook. He was the main cook at the uh, Bergen Hunt and Fish Club and Ro uh, Ravenite Social Club as well. He said to make a very good sauce. Um, he would eventually uh, be involved with some murder cases and would go to prison. Uh, but as far as I know, he is still alive and out there. Um, the final individual involved was Quack Quack Ruggiero. Now, Quack Quack Ruggiero probably is one of the main reasons Paul was killed. Um, Quack Quack couldn't shut the fuck up, and everybody knows that. That's why they called him Quack Quack. Um, it was said at one point that if you called half the phone numbers in New York, uh, Quack Quack may actually answer. Uh, that's how much he talked. Um, he was kind of a mess. I mean, he was involved with setting up multiple hits, ones that Gotti sanctioned and didn't sanction. And Ruggiero was kind of a loose cannon, um, but he was involved in this hit. He engineered uh, not only this, but other ones as well. And if we remember, Robert D.B. Bernardo was killed, uh, according to many, because he owed, uh, Angelo Ruggiero owed him money and he didn't want to pay him and they killed him. Um, he would also order a hit on Anthony Casso uh, after Casso, quote, called him a rat, uh, which that wasn't true. Eventually, Ruggiero would be shelved due to his um, subversive behavior. Uh, he also would be quoted as calling John Gotti a sick son of a bitch and that he wasn't fit to lead the family. Um, Gotti obviously looked at him as a friend, but by the end, didn't look at him as a friend and basically shelved him. He didn't kill him, uh, but being shelved is pretty much being killed. Yeah, I mean, Ruggiero brought in so many problems with his mouth, with the tapes, talking about Castellano, being involved in dealing drugs. Uh, Ruggiero was just a mess who could not get out of his own way and honestly was a constant source of problems for John Gotti and Gotti's crew with Castellano. Yeah, I've always said, I mean, he's one of the clumsiest, dumbest mobsters, I think, of all time. Um, it just, he just never really, I mean, he definitely made money. He was a smart guy, but he was a clumsy idiot as well. I mean, he talked way too much. Um, he just couldn't shut up. Uh, it's that simple. Uh, he would eventually die uh, in, um, in 1989 of cancer at his home in Howard Beach. He was only 49 years old, but he would die basically alone. He was shelved. He was told to stay the fuck away. Um, interestingly enough, his father, sorry, his son, uh, Angie Ruggiero Jr. and his nephew would both uh, go into the life uh, and uh, be involved with the mob as well. Um, so those were the people involved with the killing itself. I continue to wonder, and I talked about this last week, and it kind of goes hand in hand with Castellano and the Castellano hit. One person that we don't talk about was Jimmy Fiala. And I mentioned this last week, Blackjack, if let's say this never goes down, who was the better, who would have been better for the family? And I think really anyone but Gotti probably would have been better for the family. Um, the problem that some of these guys had some of these old school, we're not going to make waves people is, you know, they're never willing to do what they have to do to become boss. One thing you have to respect about Gotti, he was willing to go out and take it. He was willing to go out and literally do um, and commit the biggest mob murder ever um, to get what he wanted. And for the short time he was boss, um, he became the most powerful and most recognizable mobster ever, probably. Yeah, I mean, listen, he was willing to put his neck on the line, right? I mean, he was willing to go on the chopping block. A lot of guys aren't willing to do that. You know, 
you knew, right, that once you do this, someone's going to try to take a shot at you. And, and we saw it, right? We saw it happen after, after they hit on Castellano. But Gotti was willing to take the risk in order to grab the brass ring. A lot of guys aren't willing to do that. One of the individuals that we didn't discuss was Frankie DeChico. Frankie DeChico was, um, you know, very much a protege of Castellano. If you know anything about him, he would join the family in the uh, early 70s or so. Uh, He actually was very close to Paul. He came up under Paul. He was involved with unions, made a lot of money for the family. Um, He kind of, though, became disillusioned with uh, Castellano. Uh, He was sick and tired of certain things that he was doing. And as I said, he was very involved with the planning uh, of this hit. Um, Soon after Castellano's death, though, uh, DeChico would take over all the white collar racket. So he would be the guy that kind of ran all that stuff. Um, He would also be involved in a conversation with Gravano um, that he, not Gotti, should be the new boss with Gotti as underboss. Um, so that was kind of something that was interesting. Uh, DeChico would reply to Gravano, quote, John's fucking ego is too big. I could be his underboss, but he couldn't be mine. Look, he's got balls. He's got brains. He's got charisma. If we can't control him to stop the gambling and all his flamboyant bullshit, he could be a good boss. Sammy, I'll tell you what. We'll give him a shot, let him be the boss. But if it don't work within a year, me and you will kill him. I'll become the boss and you'll be my underboss and we'll run this family right. Now, that was always a fascinating thing because as we know, in 1986, Frank DeChico would be blown up in a bomb outside of the um, headquarters of Jimmy Fiala. That bombing, according to many, was carried out by Vic Amuso and Anthony Casso on orders of Chin Giganti. Now, I always wondered, did Gotti get wind of this little plan that was being involved and said, look, he's a subversive idiot and he obviously is too enthralled with his former boss, Paul Castellano. He's going to try to take my spot. I'm going to I'm going to get, let him go. Does anyone ever think about that? I don't know. I I don't know. It's one of those things we'll never have an answer to. I mean, I guess, I guess it's possible that, that Gotti was willing to serve up Frankie to Chico. Um, But I don't know. It's one of those things, Jeff, that we're never going to know if it was intentional or just kind of a happy coincidence for John Gotti that he wasn't there that day. Um, you know, I, I feel like if Gotti really wanted to Chico Gotti would have done it himself. I don't yeah, but, know it's just no, but it's just random that he just happened to not be there and then the Chico dies. I think I, Gotti maybe said, you know what? Fuck him. He's gone. And we'll kind of pin it on the, 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 the Lucchese. You know, and they probably wanted him dead anyway. So I don't know. I always wondered about that. Obviously he wasn't there for a reason. Uh, why wasn't he there? Um, all in all though, it's, it, it's, Quite simply, the most orchestrated and famous gangland hit ever. Um, it, it's kind of up there with like the killing of JFK and things it like is. that. I mean, it was completely and a hundred percent planned the right way. It went perfect. No one else was hurt. No, you know, ricochets or anything. It's pretty incredible that in the middle of Midtown Manhattan at five thirty uh, on a Monday. Not one person was hit outside of the targets. That's incredible yeah, accuracy. It is. I mean, listen, it, it was done at relatively close range, um, you know, with handguns. So, I mean, there's a little more control. But, yeah, it is, like you said, I mean, it, for those of you who, who are listening and maybe aren't familiar with New York City, it's impossible to overstate just how many people are around at that time of day. I mean, you're talking thousands of people within a couple of blocks. I mean, it, it's, it's an enormous amount of people. Um, so yeah, it is Im- impressive that nobody else got hurt, but you know, that's the way they designed it up. They executed it, like you said, perfectly. No, I think you're hundred percent right. Um, it is a iconic hit. And uh, you know, I was really hoping um, I-, I was in contact with one of our listeners and, and I was hoping to 
uh, he had a family member that was said to have been in the restaurant at the time uh, of the hit. Now, it's interesting. I wasn't able to uh, get in touch with that guy, but it's interesting. If you go to Sparks now, um, they won't talk about this hit, as far as I know, at least the, the people that run it. No. Um, I, I think from what I understand, they're, they're known to not talk about it. Um, now, it's become a place of, of lure. Uh, people go out and they'll lay on the street as if they're Castellano, right? Yeah. Um, but um, it, it is a fascinating and iconic place. And I think a place that if you're a mob fan, you know, not only do you go just to see it, but um, they got pretty damn good steaks there as well. Sparks is an excellent steakhouse. Um, so if you're in New York City, pay to visit, not just for the nostalgia, but uh, the steaks are excellent. Yeah, couldn't agree more. A um, little bit of a programming note, just kind of a quick one today. Um, you know, we're, we have a, and I think a lot of people, I've had people reach out, when are you doing Marcello? When are you doing Traficante? We're going to kind of put all the heavy hitters uh, next year. And I think what we're going to do over the next week or two, uh, we're going to take next week off. We said we were going to do that this week, but with Christmas and everything, there's a lot going on. I know people will be out shopping and everything. We'll kind of return the week after and then we'll start getting into kind of the main crux of, of our next uh, uh, person we're going to talk about. You know, we've had a lot of traveling going on with me and with Blackjack, and we get Christmas next week. So I think it's kind of a good time to uh, kind of take a week off next week and, and get back after it uh, for the last week of the year. What do you say about that, Blackjack? I like it. I like it. Christmas, hectic time of the year. Like you said, a lot of travel. Everyone, take a, take a breath, take a breather, you know, spend some time with your family, and we'll be back in the new year. Yeah, keep in mind, Christmas is next Saturday, not this Saturday, next Saturday. It's already, right. already here. Right. Blackjack, let me ask you, doesn't it seem like 2021 flew by? Really, really does. Like, I saw, really a, vi- I saw a thing that, like, you know, the like goofy, like, CNN New Year's thing. Like, I feel like that was just, like, I feel like New Year's just happened. This year has absolutely flown by. Yeah, it really, really has. Um, but uh, it's been a great year. Uh, we started this show. Um I got um, I got a really interesting text today, Blackjack, from uh, our producer. Uh, he mentioned to me that in December, uh, and keep in mind it's December fifteenth when people hear this, we have sixty nine thousand three hundred fifty five plays in December so far. Wow! Um, so shout out to every one of you, motherfuckers. Thank you for, for listening to this show. Uh, we couldn't be here without you. Uh, people have really built this thing up. They love it. They enjoy it. And I'm happy that they're here and I'm happy you're here. As always, make sure you give us a follow on Twitter at the sit down seven. You can follow us on YouTube as well. Uh, and I would urge you, please check out our sponsors. We have a lot of great sponsors for our show now. Um, there's a great way you can keep that show free. And it's by frequenting some of the sponsors, whether it's NordVPN or BetterHelp or any of the other sponsors. Make sure you check them out, please. Um, We'll be back, uh, you know, basically in, you know, 10, 12 days or so. Have a great holiday. Have a great Christmas. Uh, enjoy the time with your family. Um, I'm sure we'll get a, a mob book or two. And that's what we're going to do. The next episode, I get a question all the time about what are some great mob books. I'm going to talk a little bit about that here in the coming weeks. I think it's something that people want to hear. Yeah. Uh, Blackjack, good to have you back. Uh, any plans for Christmas? No, yeah, man, just looking forward to taking it easy for a little bit, you know? Been a, it's been a hectic month, so looking forward to taking taking a couple of weeks and just taking a breather. I hear that, and I hope you all do as well, all of you listeners out there. Uh, I am Jeff Nado. He is Blackjack Fletcher. We will be back, uh, not next week, the week after Christmas. You guys all have a great holiday. We appreciate and thank you for listening to The Sit Down. We'll see you next time.